yesterday we looked at uh, uh, how how linguistic theory works around acquisition of uh, language that is i language and uh, how it uh, how and what constitutes part of what we know as knowledge of language today we are going to look at uh, the components of a sentence in little bit more details. Uh, so, in the study of uh, in, in the study of uh, language, there are three main areas, and most of the significant questions, or even lesser significant questions, of scientific nature, have been asked in these areas, and these are the areas of structure, acquisition and change. And like, like I have mentioned it to you, we are looking at structure. Is that okay? Clear? Out of the three, the reason why we are talking about linguistic structure or the structure of a sentence is sen structure has been favorite area for many people. Most of the questions as I mentioned to you, most of the interesting questions have been asked in linguistics that are related to a structure. That is answer to those questions we get from the study of a structure of uh, language. Uh, have you heard these names that, that you see on your screen? Panini, Bloomfield, Ferdinand de Saussure, Martine, Chomsky. Chomsky I discussed yesterday. How about other names? Have you heard these names? How many of them? Uh, Panini is very famous. Panini is? For in Indian context, he is very famous. Why is he famous? Uh, he basically uh, codified Sanskrit language in a written form, the grammar of Sanskrit language. Okay. Uh, actually, you are right. that. His study is ab about Sanskrit, but when he studies Sanskrit, he talks about the structure of language and that structure is applicable to language in general. That is, uh, there is a difference between language and Sanskrit. There is a difference between language and Hindi and language and English. When we say Hindi, Sanskrit, English, Tamil, Telugu, these are examples of language. These are called a language and talking about language is about the structure of language. So, Paninian study of Sanskrit actually talks about structure of language at the level of words and I will I'll, I'll show you more. Uh, yeah, at the level so, these are the three different areas in the structure of language. So, Panini's, Panini has studied all three of them and has talked about structure, has talked about composite discussion of language. Uh, anybody remembers his famous contribution, one famous book that is synonymous with Panini? No? The, the name of that book is anybody in the last minute Ashtadhyayi Ashtadhyayi uh, and this the, this word itself means eight chapters and in eight chapters alone this this book is not more than 20 pages 25 pages in these 25 pages eight chapters he has only written rules what we can now say equations or algorithms and that describes language at the level of sounds, words and sentences. This is why I have put Panini there, the Panini, Ferdinand de Saussure, Bloomfield, uh, uh, philosophers like Martinet and a linguist Chomsky. These are the people who have, who have studied structure of language and Panini has studied at all three levels. Chomsky and others have studied language 
only at the level of sentence. However, there are contributions of Panini of studies of sounds, sound patterns of English and other others and its implications uh, for uh, structure of word and morphology as well, which, which is morphology. Okay, so, let us look at uh, sentence now in little bit more details. So, like, like we discussed Panini, let me tell you one more important, uh, important thing about Chomsky and linguistics. When Chomsky talks about I language, he talks about his, his uh, object of a study is a sentence and he talks about ideal native speaker. Anybody knows about this ideal native speaker? No. An ideal native speaker for a, for a Chomsky is, uh, it, it, first of all it does not exist in real world. The ideal native speaker is who speaks a language. If we talk, we, we talk about English, the person speaks English and speaks nice sentences like sentences like these, the door is open, this is a pen, this is a phone, these kinds of sentences he speaks. Therefore, the, the, he, the, the, therefore, we say an ideal native speaker takes a chunk as a sentence and idealizes it. However, in, in real world, we do not speak idealized sentences and I will show you what I mean by that. This is an ideal sentence, an, an, an example of an ideal sentence. What does this sentence mean? What does this sentence mean? The door is open. A state of an object. Uh, t tell me a simpler meaning what it means. This is a, this is a door, right? What is it right now? Closed. Closed. When the two, two sides of it are apart from one another, that is what probably you mean, the state of object and we say it is open. For, for Chomsky and linguistics, the important thing is to study the components of sentences, which is part of I language. When we bring E language into, which is, that is particularly discourse in it, this sentence may have different meanings. What kind of meanings do you think this sentence can have? Do you want me to give you context for that? Or can you give me some couple of different meanings of this sentence? It could mean that there is an opportunity in front of you. There is an that opportunity in front of you. The door is just a metaphor for me. And in that example, the door is being used as a metaphor for opportunity, right. Let us talk about physical reality. This is closed right now. Someone knocks at it, right, and you say the door is open. What does it mean in that context? You can come in. You can, you can come in, right. You are inside the door. Right now, you are inside and someone tells you the door is open. What does that mean? It could mean go and close the door. It could also mean get out of the You can leave it out. Right. You just get out. Right? When the person entered the door and is standing near the door and then you say the door is open, then it means please close it before you enter. It still remained open. This is called interpretations and this is part of discourse. What I am trying to tell you with this example is such things are not part of I language. Such things are not part of what we are going to discuss the structure of language. And this is why probably it is sometimes called uh, monotonous. Let us say what is it that we are going to, going to talk about and see how this could be interesting. As, as part of a, a sentence, I, I have picked up a very small one. I 
the sentence is I like pizza and again a simple sentence everybody understands the meaning of this okay if I then if I ask you what are ask you about different components of this sentence like I like and pizza can you tell me a little bit about the different components of sentence what is I in this sentence subject, subject. and like a verb very nice and pizza object object right how do you know that how do i know i is a subject in other words the question that i am asking is how do we know about subject how do we figure out that a particular component of a sentence is a subject he is doing an action that is implied by the verb on something that is implied by the object like that so someone some some component which tells us about doing some action is is a subject right in the previous sentence the door is open what is the subject I mean, doing also means also a state of being no, like I, I know I, I i am not trying to prove that you are wrong I am only trying to give you a different example. In the previous sentence, the door is open. What is the subject? Probably the door. As a matter of fact, it is a difficult question for you to answer, but let us take the door as the subject. Is the door doing anything? Doing nothing is also. Right. So, then how can we put this thing as a defining characteristic of subject when we are saying two contradictory features defining subject? doing something and not doing something both can be make a component subject do you see the contradiction we are going to talk about that but as as part of your answer you are right i is the subject of this sentence like is the verb and pizza is the object before we go to uh, subject object and verb i have put these two words subject and predicate have you heard of this word predicate and it that means predicate means okay let me please tell me the dictionary meaning of it first predicate anybody all right i i think that's a difficult question to ask is it difficult to give a dictionary meaning of predicate yeah. it is difficult because i am also not going to give it to you yeah. sentence apart from the subject the verb and the object is right that's that's precisely correct correct if we leave the subject out if we have figured out what's the subject of a sentence then everything else is the predicate in true which which essentially means that predicate includes verb and everything associated with the verb point number 1 and which also means if you look at it harder the subject is not part of predicate that is if there is a relationship between subject and the verb that relationship is additionally imposed that's not natural relationship between the two what i mean by that i'm going to Des describe that to you in a moment but in order to get these two points it's important to at least take a look at these two terms subject and predicate is, is this point clear that how the distinction how understanding the distinction between subject and predicate helps us understand that subject is an important component of a sentence but then it's not part of the predicate and everything else is part of predicate besides subject get this thing subject object and verb these are called grammatical relations in a sentence okay uh, grammatical by, by grammatical relations i mean the following uh, when i say uh, okay let's say i like pizza 
this I said subject, but this is a pronoun also, right? Am I right? This is a verb and this is an object, but this is a noun too, right? So, and, and by pronoun, what, what is the definition of a pronoun? Anybody? Any word that replaces a noun or any word that can come in place of noun. So, can we say the pronoun is also a type of noun, right? So, it is a convenient way to make a distinction between a noun and a pronoun, but eventually at the end of the day they are also nouns and uh, they a different kind of a noun of course, but they are a noun uh, because a noun can very well come in this place when we say John likes pizza, right? Now, uh, this is a noun. When it is a noun and this one is a noun, these are these are their categorical features that is by themselves they are nouns and grammatical relations are important in a sentence. These nouns or pronouns receive grammatical relations only in a sentence. Get, get, get this point? The grammatical relations are not important outside sentence. That is, there is nothing about this, this noun which makes it a subject. It is simply the place in this, uh, in this sentence that makes this a subject or the place of this noun in this sentence which makes it a subject, uh, which makes it an object. Get this? That, that is what is the meaning of grammatical relations. Take, take the example of normal life. We individually we are human beings, right? But when do, rela when do relations become important? We know about human relations, right? Mother, father, brother, sister, that becomes rele re relevant when we are looking at group, family, society, right? Individually, people are individual humans. Similarly, these individual components of a sentence may be independently nouns, verbs, nouns, pronouns, adjectives, such are their categorical features. In a, in a sentence, they receive grammatical relations like subject, object and verb. Making sense? Moving on, talking about the structure of uh, a structure of a sentence across the world, across the languages of the world. Uh, once, a, once again, how many languages are there in the world? Any idea? Which means what? I understand very little mathematics. So, five digit means? 10,000. Or 10,000. Definitely not more than 10,000. Anybody close to that? I think I have mentioned this before. Okay, that, that makes it even more interesting. Do you know the total number of languages is spoken in India? Somewhere 1700. Right. Uh, all right, I take this as 1700. Actually, uh, some records mention that it is 1652, but nobody knows the exact number. Why not 53, why 52? Nobody knows the exact number. And a, a, a rough estimate tells us around 5500 languages are spoken all over the world, which means more than or roughly one third of them are spoken in India. Out of all those languages, these are the three different structures, three common patterns that you find. In, in some languages, you find order number one, which is subject, object and verb. In some languages, you find order number two, which is 
object sorry subject verb and object what is the difference between these two these two orders the first two go ahead please tell me the difference between order number 1 and order number 2 Right. So, it is about the position of a verb. So, languages differ from one another depending upon the position of a verb in a sentence. Somebody said you speak Telugu. What is the order of the word verb in a Telugu sentence? Subject, object, and verb. Subject, object, and verb. What is the order of a verb in an English sentence? Like I like pizza. Verb, object. object. Right. And then the third order is verb, subject and object, which means depending upon the position of a verb in a sentence, whether the verb is the final constituent of a sentence, whether verb is medial, medial com component of a sentence or a verb is an initial component of a sentence, there are three types of languages in the world. In other words, all the languages of the world can be divided into three these three major categories which we say verb final languages verb medial languages and verb initial languages go ahead uh, question another permutation of object subject verb will come sir because in sanskrit we do have sentences like tat tvam asi like those things right uh, very important very very nice question when we have three components probably we can have more than three permutations, three combinations. That is not available in language. More than these permutations or combinations are not available in the languages of the world. I, I know, I know, hold on, hold on. This. I am not trying to avoid the question. All other orders that you find are called scrambling. Okay. It is also possible to come up with a sentence in Telugu or for that matter in Hindi which begins with a verb. Okay? That does not make Hindi or Telugu a verb initial language. So, same kind of poetic liberty right. like that. No, not only poetic liberty, in normal conversation also, we can use a sentence uh, which can begin with a verb. Can you think of a sentence which begins with a verb in a normal conversation? I, I know Hindi, I can give you a Hindi example. You, you understand Hindi? I can say a sentence like Kaha tha na maine tumko? Is this a good sentence? Suna nahi tumne? What is the position of a verb in these two sentences? The initial one, right? Which does not make Hindi a verb initial language. Okay? I can put a verb in the middle of the sentence as well in a language like Hindi, Telugu or Tamil. I do not know Tamil, I, therefore I cannot give you an example of it, but you, you know Telugu, can you think of a say, sentence in Telugu where verb comes in the middle now with, with the help of my example of Hindi? Sorry? Verb in the middle, uh, sentence means what? I went to cinema and Vella is sen, uh, went, okay. so you see but that is not the normal order of a Telugu sentence. What will be the normal order of a Telugu sentence? And the verb. Does that answer? Can I get an example from Malayalam also, please? The same, same, same sentence. I went to cinema, right? I went to cinema. Please, please give us the sentence first. Loud, loudly, loudly, loudly. No, you are saying, say it again. That is a so It is like saying, I cinema, cinema, went. cinema went. went. Right? Yeah. Which means, Sorry. the verb is the final component of this sentence. Now, is, is a sentence possible with verb in the middle of it? We can say that. You don't say that. We don't say that, that is not a normal order. We can say another 
right what 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 i am trying to see is whether that's an acceptable order or not it may not be well acceptable in this example but you can very well come up with some other example where a verb in the middle of a sentence is acceptable the point that i am trying to make is that doesn't make hindi telugu malayalam verb medial language or verb initial language similarly other than these three combinations are not possible and sanskrit may have examples where a sentence begins with a verb but then sanskrit is not a verb initial language and such possibilities of combinations in a real sentence in a in a language like hindi telugu malayalam or sanskrit this is called this is a special feature of language which is called a scrambling get it scrambling simply means putting words at different places these are called default order these are called default order when we make this order anything different that's called scrambling and that's a feature of all the languages of the world some languages are very rigid some languages do not allow scrambling that easily others allow more frequently all south asian languages from kashmiri to malayalam and uh, gujarati to manipuri they allow scrambling very easily a language like english on the other hand which is very well an indian language too does not allow scrambling that much uh, we cannot say i cinema went in a normal order or or in a in a scrambled order as well we cannot say that uh, went to cinema people say where you understand what you wanted to say i went to cinema or uh, something else but scrambling in a language like english is not that easy there are reasons for that and we we will talk about those reasons some other time are the orders of words in a sentence clear there are three things that i want you to understand from this slide first uh, uh, about a sentence subject and predicate orders order of uh, words in a sentence and then about grammatical relations clear okay now uh we have we we looked at this part, this thing we discussed that uh predicate consists of everything else in a sentence which leaves us with a question what is a subject we tried to look at that as well that what makes a noun like john the subject of this sentence is an important question that we need to answer we will we will develop or evolve answer to this question what is a subject of a sentence throughout our discussions at this point i want to mention it to you that it's not an easy question to answer as you can see that it's okay to say sometimes the agent of the action in the sentence is the subject of of the sentence that's one probable definition of subject of a subject in a sentence but that's that doesn't hold too long okay so we'll we'll keep looking at these things uh similarly what makes pizza an object of this uh object of this uh verb an object in this sentence is purely related to its position okay uh we will talk about that as well so in these two sentences that you see on your screen i like pizza and i teach linguistics to ma students everything in red that you see is a predicate and i happens to be the subject ah uh, okay so let's let's look at the next one uh before we look at other components of uh, the sentence let me talk to you about verbs how do we define a verb anybody uh, let me begin with a very simple question you sir how do we define a verb what is a verb verb 
verb is an action. Verb is a word that talks about some action in a sentence. Is that what you want to say? Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Uh, anything else anybody wants to say about that? That is the, that's the physical description of a verb. In, inside a sentence, what is the role of a verb? Very nice. So, if we look at this sentence, John likes a pizza. In this sentence, John and pizza do not make a sentence, right? And individually, they, they, do, they are not either subject or they are not object. They are subject, they are nouns. They become a subject or an object around verb. So, verb is a very significant component of a sentence. In other words, sometimes verbs are said to be powerhouse of a sentence. That is, everything else evolves around verb. There are uh, uh, two types of verbs in general in all the languages of the world. And the, these two types are, as you can see here, transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. I have tried to define it little bit. Can I ask you what these two words mean again, transitive and intransitive? And I am particularly asking you about the dictionary meaning because I want to draw your attention to a very simple point that some, some words in the study of a structure of language like predicate, intransitive, transitive are difficult to, to describe through dictionary meanings. Okay? So, a transitive verb means what? Please. The transitions to… Shows transition such as, please elaborate on transition. Object should accompany the verb. Sir. I mean, I like. It's not a complete sentence. I like something. So okay. Something can be anything. Sir. I mean, these are something. Those are whatever. True. So, if you take uh, intransitive, I sleep. Mm -hmm. That completes the sentence. Sir. I mean, we don't need object for that. Very nice. Do you understand what he's saying? So it's, it's very, very nice description of it. That a transitive verb necessarily requires an object. And when we say necessarily requires an object, that necessary requirement is about completion of the sentence. A transitive verb which requires an object in the absence of the of such object does not give us a complete sentence like this one. If we drop the object from this sentence like John likes pizza or I like pizza, if I simply say I like. This does not give you a complete meaning. When I stop at this point, I like, probably you are waiting for me to complete it or if I do not, then you can very well ask this question like what? Did not understand what you were, what you are trying to say. At the same time, intransitive verbs are not, uh, do, intransitive verbs do not need objects and which means again without objects they are complete. When I, when we say, I, I am sleeping, the, you, you, you do not ask any further question, you understand this sentence, right? Uh, but, but, so that, that is okay, but how do I know that a verb like sleep will not need an object or a verb like eat or read or like will need an object? This also has relevance for teaching, this uh, teaching any language. Sir, you can ask you like what, right. you eat what, you read what, but you cannot ask you sleep what. So, essentially a transitive verb, uh, you can ask what at the end of a transitive verb and it does not it becomes transitive verb, but uh, intransitive words will tend to answer questions like where, 
and when you can say i slept in my room or i slept last night you can't ask you slept what you can only ask you slept where or you slept how or you slept when true do we understand this great runs great answer simple simple test if you can ask the question what with a verb take take any verb and if you can ask a question and that is a meaningful question then it's an, it's a transitive verb in other words if the question is meaningful probably you are going to get an answer also and the answer of to that question will make it will become the object of that verb okay so you can ask this question ask a question here i like pizza i like what right answer to this question pizza or dosa or anything else is the object of that that verb if a verb does not allow a question with what just with what it doesn't matter whether you can really make a question for that verb or not no other question word is important if the verb does not allow you a question with what then it's an intransitive verb again if the verb does not allow you a question with that with what probably you don't get an answer either so go what not a good question therefore you are not expecting any answer either which helps you conclude that this is an intransitive verb so what are we doing with this question what basically what are we doing with this question what we are trying to figure out whether we whether the verb needs an object or not and only one question word which is what helps us figure this out that makes us uh, find out about these about verbs whether a verb is transitive or an intransitive verb amazing this this test works for 99% of time sometimes it may not uh, i can i however that doesn't mean this is not a good test if it works for 99% of time it's good but it's important for us to know that it doesn't work everywhere i can give you one example i don't have it on the screen i can give you one example of the verb meat in english meat transitive or intransitive transitive or intransitive transitive why sir even if we use sentences like why don't we meet it is nothing but a form of object and verb again uh, sorry object and the subject again Meat can be both, sir. Yeah, so. Both and intransitive. Anybody else? Anything? No. But suppose if it's a transitive verb, right? How do I know it's a transitive verb? This test doesn't work. But then it doesn't answer the question what. So if it is. we 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 are not contesting whether it it can be both or not T taking it as an example of a transitive verb our test does not work here but it's it this definitely can be a transitive verb we can say i met with a doctor i cannot say i met when i say i met this is not a complete sentence see now i want to relate this to what i was discussing with you yesterday which is knowledge of language when this particular aspect of language is part of knowledge of language that is for native speakers they do not look at this question to make to make it certain that this is a transitive verb or an intransitive verb it's it's clear in their mind that this is a transitive verb this is an intransitive verb some something else is intransitive when they say i met when someone tells the, a native speaker of english i met they immediately know that the sentence is not complete say it, say it more 
and then we know that that is not an intransitive, that is not an intransitive verb, it is a transitive verb, but this test does not work. That is all I wanted to say that this does not work. So, sometimes objects may be of different nature, that is all it means. So, not all those objects have to come out of the question what. However, now more than 99 percent of the time it works. There are there are a few more examples, uh, we, we can talk about them later. Okay. Uh, before I go to the real structure of a sentence to show you phrase structure, this is one more important uh, thing to talk about which is part of the predicate. So, we looked at the verb, they are of two types, transitive verbs, intransitive verbs and verbs are central element of a sentence, it is also called powerhouse, all other elements develop around it, great, nice. So, let us talk about objects as well. Objects are as we have just seen, objects are in a way a component that defines verb, that defines type of a verb. If, they, if we have an object, it is a transitive verb, if we do not have an object, it is an intransitive verb. Therefore, objects being part of predicate and closely related to verb is no surprise for us that we have just seen, but they can be of different types. And the two types that are very commonly known are, co are called uh, direct objects and indirect objects. So, can you tell me something about direct object or indirect objects again besides what is written on the screen? How do we know an about an object whether an object is in direct object or indirect object? And again the dictionary meaning of these two words direct and indirect does not help us much. It is its configurational relation to the verb and only the way these objects are related to a, to a verb is what tells us about whether the whether an object is direct object or indirect object. The direct, ob the direct object uh, follows the verb. The direct object follows the verb. So, does an indirect object, but you added the word immediately, the direct object immediately follows the verb. Great example. And so, in the okay, hold on. So, I, I is this distinction clear what you see on the screen? In a sentence, I teach linguistics to MA students, linguistics is direct object and two MA students is an indirect object, right. That is just a, a broad distinction, but I am glad you asked this, uh, you raised this question. We can say I teach MA students linguistics. In that sentence, I teach MA students linguistics, we still have MA students as indirect object and linguistics as direct object. What that answers the question what? Exactly. The direct object will be the answer to the question what? I am sorry, you were saying something. I am guessing indirect object will be the answer to the question to what or to who. Add something to the direct object. By. Sure. It could be you are, you are right, it could be an answer to whom. If you can ask this question for a subject, uh, sorry, for a verb. For example, if I say I like pizza, this sentence is good enough with a direct object. This sentence does not need an indirect object. So, when I say I eat a pizza, the question to whom is not relevant. Therefore, this sentence is good enough with a direct object. When a sentence needs both at a time, direct object and indirect object, that is when a verb needs both, that type of verb 
has a different name and that name is what are the names that you have seen so far? What are the types of verbs you have seen so far? Intransitive, transitive, and this type of verb is called ditransitive. So, transitive verb is a verb when it needs one object, ditransitive is the one when it needs two. So, a verb like teach is a is type of a ditransitive verb, it needs two objects at a time. So, when I say I teach linguistics to a native speaker of English, this is an incomplete sentence. The same way I like is an incomplete sentence. We need to say teach linguistics, there is something missing. This may not be intuitively available to us, that is this distinction may not be intuitively available to someone who does not English need, who does not speak English natively. You understand what I am saying? For lot of us who speak English as a second language, I teach linguistics can be a good sentence. Therefore, it may be difficult for us to find what, what is the incompleteness about this sentence. So, if we are unable to derive incompleteness about that sentence, that is because we are not the native speakers of English. Okay. However, this sentence will remain incomplete if you do not put in direct object. The order of direct object and indirect object is important, but when, it, when they change their position, they do not change their grammatical relations. And the answer uh, and what you said about answer to the question what is the actual meaning of what I mean when I have put here close to verb and away from the verb. So, the, the object that is an answer to the question what is the object that is close to the verb. Again, it has one more meaning close to the verb or away from the verb that I will show you when I talk about configurational relationship between these components for the syntax of it. Any, any other question that you may have about these things? No? In that case, we will stop here and we talk about configurational relationship of elements in a sentence tomorrow.